Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, a strange new species of prehistoric dolphin has been named, some incredible fossils of a Triassic marine reptile have been revealed, there's new evidence of the Gorgonopsian in Ostransevia in Africa, and more. Starting off the news this week, the big news in space has been the successful landing of the Odysseus moon lander, making it the first successful mission to soft land on the moon by a private company. Unfortunately, this success did not last for long, as it is believed that the lander tipped over after its landing, resting now on its side. Strangely enough, the lander is still largely operational, with its radio antennas still facing towards Earth and its solar panels still seemingly able to draw enough power from the sun. All but one of its instruments is still operational at this orientation, so the lander still should be able to do some good old science. The company behind the lander, called Intuitive Machines, has said that they have not yet identified the cause of the fall with certainty. They currently believe that one of the lander's feet probably caught a rock when it landed, and as there was still some movement perpendicular to the moon's surface, this could have caused the issue. It also could have been a structural failure, such as a landing leg collapse. All in all though, Intuitive Machines seem pretty happy with the results, and will look to learn from the issues they have had so far before launching the other two moon moon missions they have planned for this year. In other news, we're sticking with astronomy, and indeed moons, but heading over to two of our most distant planetary neighbours. Using ground-based telescopes, astronomers have discovered a new moon around Uranus and two new moons around Neptune. To be honest, it would probably be more accurate to say that these two moons have been announced or confirmed, with the initial observation of Uranus's new moon taking place in 2023, and Neptune's new moon first being spotted in 2021. These discoveries have this week been confirmed by the International Astronomical Union, which is the place to get such discoveries officially ratified, and we can welcome three new, albeit very small and faint, moons to our solar system. Uranus's new moon is probably its smallest, only being 8 kilometres wide with Neptune's two moons being slightly larger at 14 and 23 kilometres. Each of these bodies take a very long time to orbit their host planets, at 380 days, 9 years and nearly 27 years respectively. Now you may notice we're not using their names to reference them, and that's because they haven't been given permanent names yet. Both planets have a naming tradition for almost all of their moons, and so Uranus's moon will be named after a character from a Shakespeare play, and Neptune's moon will be named after a Nereid sea goddess from ancient Greek mythology. Some really cool news then that shows that even in our own solar system, there are more secrets to uncover and more discoveries to be made. We've been from one end of the solar system to the other, and we're now flying a long, long way away as astronomers have observed a rather surprisingly massive black hole at a distance that they wouldn't expect. The specific observation was a very distant red source of light that seemed very like a quasar-like object. As light takes time to reach Earth, or rather our eyes, or to our telescopes, like the James Webb telescope that made this observation, when we look at distant objects, we are observing them as they were in the past. This means that the further we look away, the further into the past we look. So these incredibly distant objects can tell us a huge amount about the early universe. Publishing this work in the journal Nature, the researchers say that this black hole could be the missing link between black hole seeds and the first luminous quasars. This observation is an outlier in the black holes and galaxies around us, it is significantly larger than them. A fantastic new piece of research then, that sheds yet more light onto the beginnings of our universe, and is yet another example of the James Webb telescope showing off as its capabilities are utilised by astronomers to uncover some fascinating facts about how the universe became what it is today. Also in the news, a recently published paper describes how scientists have unravelled the mystery of how baleen whales sing. The voice boxes from three stranded dead whales, a humpback, minke and a say whale, were studied and found to be quite different to ours. For us to make sounds, we need to pass air over our vocal cords producing vibrations, 
but baleen whales don't have vocal cords. Instead, they have a U-shaped structure with a cushion of fat at the top of the larynx, which is used to produce sound. The scientists discovered that this vocal anatomy allows the animals to sing by recycling air, and it prevents water from being inhaled. The scientists also used computer models and found that although baleen whale songs can be very loud, the structure of their voice box means that the whales are unable to produce sounds louder than those produced by the shipping industry. They also discovered that whale song is restricted to a narrow frequency of 30 to 300 hertz that overlaps with the anthropogenic noise produced by ships. This means that most calls from a baleen whale are masked by vessel noise and that their unique vocal production system does not allow them to change this. Thus, their ability to communicate is severely hampered by shipping noise. For marine mammals, being able to produce sound and to hear it is of vital importance for them to be able to communicate with each other, particularly for species such as the Antarctic blue whale, which need to attract a mate over vast distances. The impact on baleen whales is huge, and hopefully this discovery can go some way to help reduce anthropogenic noise for the benefit of all marine animals. First up in the paleontology news is the fantastic description of a new species of prehistoric dolphin with a unique way of catching fish. Found in 22 to 23 million year old rocks in New Zealand, this toothed whale has been named Orea rerehua, with Orea coming from the Maori word for cloak pin in reference to its tooth shape, while rerehua means beautiful, describing its well-preserved face. Orea is known from a skull, vertebrae and ribs, and is related to other extinct tooth whales that had forward projecting front teeth that are thought to have been used to strike at and entrap prey. Orea would also have had some front teeth that projected forwards, but further back in its jaws, the teeth were quite different, being laterally splayed out and recurved. When the jaws were closed, these curved teeth would then have formed a sort of cage structure, which could therefore have trapped fish. This anatomy, combined with the flexibility of its neck, its small size compared to its relatives, and its quite flat skull, therefore seems to suggest that Aurea could have been suited to hunting in shallow waters. It's an amazing new species that adds a great deal to our knowledge of cetacean feeding styles. Also in the recent paleo news, we have a new genus and species of dinosaur to welcome this week as well. It's a new kind of Mamenchisaurid sauropod dinosaur from China, and it's been called Jingjia Dongjingjensis. It was found in late Jurassic Age rocks in the south of China, and the fossil material recovered includes partial vertebrae from the back, hip region and tail, plus parts of the forelimbs and a bone from the right hind limb. As it's a Mementosaurid, this means it's a relative of Mementosaurus itself, famous for its extraordinarily long neck even for a sauropod. Jingjia therefore adds to the known diversity of sauropods in the late Jurassic of this region, helping paleontologists to gain a better understanding of how these enormous animals underwent evolutionary radiations. This last week has also seen the publication of a paper that has provided an updated description of the amazing Triassic-aged aquatic reptile Dinocephalosaurus orientalis, with details of some spectacular additional fossils of this species. Originally named in 2003, based on fossils found in China, this was a very long-necked and long-tailed reptile with adaptions from a ringing lifestyle. There has been quite a bit of disagreement over what sort of reptile Dinocephalosaurus was, but this new paper has found it to place in a group related to another very long-necked Triassic reptile, Tanistrophius. However, they stress that the similarities between this animal and Dinocephalosaurus are mostly due to convergent evolution, since they're still in separate groups and so the elongated necks evolved separately. The function of the very long neck of Dinocephalosaurus is still not clear, but it was most likely used to help these animals capture fish. Indeed, one of the fossils of the reptiles actually preserves fish as stomach contents. Some of the newly reported specimens are incredibly well preserved and very large in size, showing that Dinocephalosaurus could achieve a maximum length of up to 6 metres. 
So some wonderful and scientifically invaluable new fossils of this magnificent Triassic reptile. And finally for the news this week, we've got an exciting Gorgonopsian discovery. You may remember that in May of 2023, we reported on a paper announcing that the largest Gorgonopsian genus, Inos transcevia, was found to have been present in South Africa, despite it previously having only been known from Russia. This was pretty surprising, and also showed that towards the end of the Permian period, as the infamous Great Dying Mass Extinction event was beginning to take place on land, the top predators of this part of the world were rapidly going extinct one after the other and being replaced by different predators. Inus transcevia was a replacement of a different Gorgonopsian lineage called Rubigine that is only found in Africa, and then Inus transcevia went extinct too and later became replaced by different animals. This new paper now reports more fossil discoveries of Inus transcevia in Africa this time in Tanzania. The fossil in question is a premaxilla from the front of the snout that can be confidently assigned to the genus since it has four incisors, a unique feature of Inus transcevia among Gorgonopsians. Very interestingly though, this specimen comes from slightly older rocks than the South African Inus transcevia and would have coexisted with other big body Rubigians, which were still around at the time. So, very intriguing, and it seems to suggest that it wasn't the extinction of the Rubigians and the opening up of new niches that drove the Illustrancevia lineage further south in Pangaea, since they were overlapping in these times and places. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hoped you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. This is also a particularly special episode, as the day of this video's upload, the 28th of February, marks six years exactly since the very first episode of Seven Days of Science was uploaded back in 2018. So from all of us here who work on the series, thank you so much for sticking around and watching our weekly updates and for all your support in helping to grow this series into what it's become. And here's to another six years and many, many more. Woo.